Welcome to the fire table. I'm here with Tudor Franco, my friend. How are you doing, my Good, friend? Good, man. I'm so glad you're here, dude. Thanks for having me. It's so short. Every time you come here, you're so short, man. Why didn't you just, you know, get a condo here or something? <laughs> or you're here will, all the time. I know. I will probably do it at some point, but it's always glad to see you and be part of your show. Absolutely, man. We'd love to have you always. But I have a question for you today. What does the word financially freedom means to you, man? Is that a time? Is that a money? Is it a dollar sign? What does that mean? But think deep through. Well, financial freedom to me um, means that um, I need to have more time if I can using financial methods. Because I always think about money being like an idea, right? So you don't, you know, you can create money with ideas that you have. As, as much money you can create with your ideas, the more time you can free up. The problem is that as much money you can make, you cannot make more time. So you have a finite you know, number of days or hours a day or whatever, how you, however you want to take it. Um, but that's all we have, right? So as much better we can conserve that time and use it the way we want it, the better. So, you know, we can use whatever money ideas we can create to free up your time. I think financial freedom is one component of the, the whole scenario for being freedom overall. I think it's one of the components. Yeah. Because think about it. If you're, let's say you're financial free, but let's say you don't have time because you have to work. Financial free can be an aspect that, oh, I don't need to look at the price tag to buy something. I could just buy without thinking about it, without planning. But at the same time, what is the price that you have to pay to be friend, that freedom? And then you can be trapped in another areas yes. that is not freedom with your health, with your time, like you said. Right. It's a vicious cycle. Like the more, the more you work to make more money, the less time you have, you can get in other problems, health problems, whatever. Um, but at the end, you can get financially free. That means you have enough money to do whatever you want with your time. So it comes to time, however you want to think about it, it's all about how you use your time in this life, right? So it, it's interesting because I read a book a while ago. Um, it was called Die With Zero. Mm. It's a very interesting concept. Um, he has some great ideas there that says, you know, no matter how much you work to make more money, you're going to end up one day um, with no time. We all know what that means. And what do you do with your money at that point? It's not yours anymore. So however much money you produce during your life, you need to consume at some point. Or you say, okay, I'll leave it to my, you know, kids or family wife or, or family whatever. or whatever. Or the government. Right. Or you is donate or charity yeah. or whatever it is, right? But the problem is that you... The most you can do in your life, that's pretty much all you can do because that time is finite and we're all going to reach that point at some point. So true, man. And uh, <clears throat> that's a powerful book that I want to read it. I'm going to die with zero. Yes. First, I'm not like, like that, but I know people, actually close people to me that they're just focus about the next dollar sign, next dollar sign, and just accumulating, accumulating. But it's like, what point of time that you're just going to ma make one decision that involve happiness? That would be like, man, I don't care. I just want to do this because I want to do it. That could be all the way yeah. from you know, going on a trip, for buying this house, buying this car or something, you know. It's a very different mindset, especially on a scarcity that is today, like people, how money is depreciated and people are just finding ways to get more money by selling their time for money. Right. 
and it's, it's very interesting. Well, one easy example on on this idea is right. Um, it doesn't really matter how much money you have when you're sick. You forget about money. You know, your primary focus is shifting to your health. So everybody has to have those priority in place. You know, what do I value more? Right? Do I value making more money and risking my health and consuming my time? Or do I get a balance between how much money I make, how healthy I am, how much time do I have to exercise or to eat well or to travel or to spend time with family, whatever it is. So I think it's all about like getting those components in a, in together. Do you have a good balance? Do you feel like? I think I do right now. Yes, I think I do have a good balance. I worked on it a lot, you know, giving my like immigrant history and coming here, basically starting a new life with, you know, new family, kids, um, work, investments, whatever it take. But I think at this point, you, I'm, I'm okay where, where I am uh, in terms of balance because I realize that my health right now, it's what's going to count till the end. It's going to take you there, <laughs> yes. the health for sure. That's, a, that's one big thing. And is that the trajectory of your life? Was that planned or did it just happen? <laughs> I would like to say it was planned, <laughs> but it was not because life is the way it is. We all know this. You, it, it throws you away. The plans that you make are useless. Um, so you need to have this kind of sixth sense to adapt to whatever circumstance you're put in in life and kind of maneuver in a way that, you know, positions you better. So I think you have to have that, that quality or develop that quality in your life to, to reach that balance between time and money and health. Right. I, I believe we all got to have a plan. Like, because if you don't have a plan, you don't have a sense of direction. I say this on the other uh, interview that was given and then, you know, Alice on the Wonderland, right? Yeah. Everybody knows that movie. And she, the cat asked, where are you going? And she was like, oh, I'm, uh, I'm lost. I was like, how come you're lost if you don't know where you're going? Right? right. You get lost where you have, you know where you're going. You can get lost. You can deviate, you know. But I think all of us, it's important to have a plan. And I, I'm not the most planner, guys. But throughout what I really, looking back 10 years back from my life and now, I try to plan and I'm a better planner. I know that's not going to be up to plan as always, but shift it. But at least you have one direction. If he pivots and twivels, yes. you know, you, you can ad adapt. I, I don't call that plan. I call that goals. Because for me, reaching a goal is more of a trajectory than a planning type of thing. And I'm trying to So you're see saying how, like you want to know the outcome, how you get there, right. it doesn't matter. Exactly. And how you get there to that outcome, it's not going to look the way you plan it most of the time. Sure. Um, so I, you know, in retrospective, you look back in your life, in everybody's life, the way we were 10 years ago, everybody was like, oh my God, this was 10 years ago. It's unbelievable how much I grew or how much I changed or look at me now or whatever. So if you think 10 years from now, you'll be like, I can't do that. Yes, you can. Because you did what you couldn't have think about doing 10 years ago. So it's a mindset. It's all about mindset. It's all in our heads, the way we can do things or we think we can do things. So that's all I have, like my, whatever my life was so far, I reached that point where I think I'm able to say a goal and I don't know how I'm going to get there, but the biggest the goal, the biggest the outcome. Even if I don't reach that goal, I'm much better than I was. And how do you set your goals? Is that per year or is that by, as you go? 
So in general, I think um, I'm trying to have like a six months, a year goal and usually about five year goals. Um, and they're, they're, they're very, I would say, um, precise things that I write down, um, crazy things, uh, you know, things that are unusual. And, um, you know, I, most of the time what I think is that the, the way I say those things, they're going to happen to me, mm. you know, manifesting, the, manifesting the, the, the way you want things. It matters a lot because you, you create that mindset in your head that it's real, whatever you want, it's going to be real. And you know, there's a, a typical quote in the alchemist book and says, you know, the more you want something, the more the universe is going to conspire to make it happen. So it's a mindset and a manifestation of your goals. And it, the way it's going to, you know, it's going to happen one way or another. I, I didn't, I didn't have no idea I'm going to come to United States. Honestly, I had no idea years ago. And I said, in five years from now, I'm going to be in the United States. There was impossible at that time. But the way I worked every day and I thought about it every day, I find ways to get there. It's not, not, it was nothing planned. Right. But it was, it was a combination of things that brought me to that goal. And I think your brain started working towards it, like how to make it happen, finding avenues and ways, you know, because you manifested and because you were talking about it. Yes. It's interesting, man. I wasn't much into this kind of stuff. Like I wasn't, never was brought up to me, um, to my background, like setting goals. And I just like, you have to accept where you are, yeah. what's your life, be humble, get what the life brings you. Yes. Right? Which is in a way is great, but like I feel some people get stuck in that, man. And like I was. And now being around people such as yourself and other people that really changed my life or influenced me to be how to, hey, you deserve better. You just put the goal on it, man, and you figure it out. Yeah, and it, it's, again, like both of us, right? We got out of our comfort zones all the time. And that's all it's all about. You think you cannot do things because they're impossible for you or you cannot reach those goals. But if, if you get out of what the little bubble you're in, you realize that you can achieve much more than you think. Like, you know, a few years ago, for example, I, you know, I, I didn't know I'm, I'm going to be um, learning about wines and, uh, you know, study wines and whatever. It was always a, a passion of mine, but I was thinking, why, why don't I just like learn about it? Like on a, on a, like, you know, constructive way. Whatever, yeah. And three years later, I'm I'm a I'm a diplomat of this uh, whatever Sorry. you know wine and um, spirit education trust, um, and I never thought I'm going to do it. it. It's a hard thing to do, but I did it because I I worked you know constantly on that mindset of reaching that goal. I don't know how I did it, but I did it. Right, the same thing with everything. Like you have probably in your history you know stuff that oh my god you think back and you said how could i do this that's crazy i started invested in real estate that was one right of them, right to be the amount of transactions that we're doing right now and yeah. value that was a huge out of the comfort zone man which you know uh, speaking of which i want to you know for everybody that's listening you're a doctor anesthesiologist and how did you start Invest in real estate because I know you started in a single family, but what was that moment like, you know, I need to invest? Because usually a lot of people thinking out on a mess with that, but how'd you get started? What was that moment? Yes. Um, I always say that I never knew anything about investing, especially in real estate. I mean, I, I grew up in a communist country. We had nothing like this ever in our heads or education or anything like that. So I came here in the United States and I figured out that I'm going to. I'm starting to make a lot of money and I, f I start educating myself financially and found out that the only like real value that's in things is in like 
real things. Yeah. Uh, things that you can palpate. And I always had this background from my country, you know, from my grandfather and all my family that, as you know, in those countries, when you want to invest in something, you either buy buildings, land. you either buy land, or you either buy, uh, you know, gold and silver. That's pretty much was it. Um, so I came here and, I, you know, thought about all these options. And the first thing I did was uh, purchase a property um, in Baltimore, the first investment property. It was in a bad neighborhood. Uh, I, you know, we didn't make much more a month. I think it was probably less than $100 cash flow a month. Did and you acquire finance or you bought it cash? We bought it cash. We bought it cash. And <laughs> it was a lot of money for that time. And, you know, you go there, you will start working on your, you know, yourself on like fixing the gutters and, you know, cleaning the place and sweating, you know, in the house Being to fix up the house. love and all right, this effort. Change the blinds and all this stuff by myself and then rent it for, what, $100 a month cash flow. It was nothing. But yeah. it was the possibility happening to me. And it was not about money. It was about the mindset that I can do that in the future. And like you experience right now with your business, it's scalable. At that point, you realize, oh, I can do two. I can do five. I can do 10. Or I can just buy an apartment building for 200 units. Oh, excuse me. I can buy five apartments for 200 units. Right? So all of a sudden, it becomes like exponential. And that, that's where you ch have to change your mindset automatically and think, I can do one thing, I can do 10. It's just a matter of time. That's so amazing. from one little investment property that I made less than $100 a month, you know, you scale up at, what, 5,000 units now, whatever it is, uh, properties and, you know, investment um apartment buildings it's outstanding dude so and after that how many well you had how many houses altogether that's that about 30, 30 30 houses yeah holy shit you bought yeah. all cash or do you have financing yeah money? most mostly cash most of them mostly all cash. cash there were some with financing but we we tried to pay it off really fast and you know um so there was a lot of equity well the time what? frame yeah. timeline then was not like now it was like 20 years ago so, so if you would have done again, would have done differently? Because this is a hard question because. No, but the question is, if, if you pay cash, then your cash is stuck in the house instead of leveraging finances. So that's, that's my main question. Yes. But again, it was, an, it was an evolution of my mindset. Retrospectively, if I think back now, I would have started probably small apartment buildings like and get four and, blacks or yes blacks. and just leverage whatever money i have put a down payment get a loan run on a cash flow refinance and multiply that investment buying single family homes was the thing there and you know when i listened to robert kiyosaki saying in his book and in his seminars at that time 20 something years ago uh, start with single family homes, right? So I did. But after a few years, I re realized that I'm, I'm not, I don't have that much time to scale that business in single family homes. Like, I don't want to be like 70 years old and do single family homes. <laughs> so I want to scale that business much faster. And all of a sudden, you know, after you accumulate a certain number of houses, you realize that you can convert that equity in one place and scale from that point. And it was exponential at that time because it's, you know, you, you talking about the cash flow of, you know, a few hundred dollars a month to a few thousands a month. So to answer a question, I would probably start with small family, you know, multifamily buildings and go from there. I still have two right now that i'm still running you know small multi-family buildings right because back in the days too you know i i know that single family houses that's the thing we try 
to educate a lot of our investors and I'll probably do the same. The first thing that people think about real estate investing is buying one house and putting tenants on, you know? And we did actually a case study on our first single family that I had, and then I came in later and helped be a professional landlords. Yep. You know, she was not cash flowing, then we legalized the basement. Um, uh, we put tenants on and we're cash flowing now thousand dollars a month. I was like, ooh, that how can you scale this, right? But then and she's when she sold it, she made a very good penny on it. But then we were making math, including our hours, because that's the thing. We entrepreneurs, we don't usually count our hours yes. very well, right? But if you were to put it on a paper Because you have passion, you know? I know, but that's the, that's the thing, that's the caviar. If you put everything on a paper including your hours and whatever the amount do you define your hours to be, you end up almost losing money or breaking even. Yes. Right? Versus on a multifamily side now that we do have investors and we invest passively, we invest passively. I have one investor of mine that put $1 million into one of my deals. He, I don't, I think he knows the name of the property. That's about it. Yeah. He, he's, He's not from here, from out of state, never visited the property, don't care, don't know. But guess what? His money is going to double up. It's already double up from the time that we invested in without having to do any of his hours and anything. And that's what I usually try to educate our investors to be like, you know, buying a house, there is complications that come with their responsibilities. And if you're going to put a management company that you can't put a management company if you want, but it's just going to eat pretty much of your profits. Absolutely. You know? Yeah, that's, yeah, a, that's well, a big but thing. I'm, but I'm gaining equity. Screw your equity, man. I mean, you can yeah. do this a lot faster without having to do anything. It's more secure now. Yeah, I mean, it's the same amount of money and time that you put in on a transaction, right? Yeah. It's one transaction. It doesn't matter if it's one unit or 200. It's going to be one transaction for the same amount of time and the same amount of money. So why not getting of your comfort zone and think I can not only buy more units, but I can exponentially increase the profit with the same amount of time and money that I have. So that's why being an, a passive investor is sometimes better than being a general partner in a deal because your velocity of money moves faster with less time put in exactly. compared to the general partners which as we all know we yeah. work for that right we we attend to the property we do asset management we do a lot of things that require our time we get compensated for that but for a passive investor it's sometimes much easier to do that just you know invest in a property that you know it's going to be run well by that sponsorship team and um you know at the end get the profits yeah 100 percent. what the hell <laughs> we're not in hell anymore what? We're not in hell anymore. No, we're back in hell. Okay, we're back in hell. Okay, let's <laughs> go to, through it. We went to the <laughs> darkness for a little bit, and then we <laughs> you know what's the best time to get out of hell, right? What? Just go through it. Really? Yeah. Hmm, interesting. <laughs> Man, it's it's been a great conversation and uh, velocity of money. There is actually a formula that you can calculate how much you. Your, your your hourly rate worth, it's a calculation between your net worth and you divide about so much. And I don't know the calculation on top of my head, but uh, it's this flickering again, holding. Do you know that calculation, by the way? No, I don't I don't know that calculation. Yeah. Just for you put in perspective, right? For yeah. example, on, on our landscape company, I calculated all of our overheads, how many guys on a field, and then I have an hourly rate that I charge when I bid, right? I have hourly rate to cut even, to make profit, and to make more profit, mm -hmm. right? So mm -hmm. I have three different variables. And with that, that's how we estimate or my jobs. 
But it's the same thing when you, it's very interesting. I'm going to find that formula and put it here in the link so you can calculate by your net worth and know your hours. How much is, it's a obviously, you know, they yes. all relevant, but if you know your hours and now everything that you're going to do now, and it's like, man, if I spend two hours in this, if I would have paid this amount of my hours, you're going to think, you're going to look at things totally different. Yes, from absolutely. Now on. Absolutely. It's OPM and OPT. Yeah, you're going to be like, man. If other I, people's money, other people's time. Yeah. And at, at some point, it's, it's probably worth paying someone to do the job. Which is interesting you say that. That's why I read this book called Who Not How. Oh, amazing book. Yeah. Awesome. Amazing book. Yeah. And it talks exactly about that. Right. And when you get that and you you give yourself value and then you'd be like, this is how much my hourly rate is. Yeah. You know, and then you're like, man, if I would have washed or changed the oil of my car, unless if it gives you pleasure, sure, man. But it's like some people say, oh, I can save 40 bucks by doing it myself or whatever. Get the tools. But then you spend an hour and I, I, I use that example because I used to do that. Yeah. Right? We all did. You take right? your car to like uh, to sort of the change is going to be. Forty dollars more, what you you have done yourself, and getting your hands dirty, get under the car, and it's spilling, and then you get this oil, you have to change it to a station to dump it. Oh my God! Yeah, absolutely, and that and that's valid for any kind of way of leveraging, right? You can leverage time, you can leverage money, and you can leverage um, other people's uh, ideas too. So when you are in a team like we are, usually in a sponsorship team, right, for a multifamily investment um, project, that's why we're in a team, because everybody brings something to the table, and you basically what you do, you leverage someone else's in the team time, money, ideas, resources, and everybody has tasks to do 100%. in the project. Yep. And you accomplish a much better goal than yourself, right? So that's that. That's an amazing concept to me. Um, transitioning from single-family homes to multifamily, because people tend in single-family homes to do single investments by themselves, where in multifamily the word multi is applying apply to everything you have a multi team to invest with you have a multi investor pool and you have a multi families and in the yes uh in the apartment building yeah so everybody leverages everybody else um and then the whole thing scales up so much for the sponsorship team, for the uh, part, uh, limited partners, and even the par probably the most important for the tenants. Absolutely, 100%. That's so powerful you say that, man. It makes totally sense, which, you know, it creates a stronger link, right? That is more unbreakable. If you have vacancy, for example, if you have five houses yeah. or one house that vacants then you have a hundred percent vacancy right yes. if you have 200 apartments you know that that number is just so much higher let's give it a pause here can you reset restart that computer it's i think it's just that computer because it logged out yeah Is it what? It's a wine I know, I told you. <laughs> we get closer and more intense now. Yeah. Now we got to talk about your masculinity. Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, what a long day for you, my friend. It is. Do you sleep on the plane a little? A little. I can't sleep on the plane. Yeah, usually. me neither. Are you flying back today? He yep. is. Man, Tonight. Man, it's crazy. I know, right? <laughs> Only me. That's how much I love this guy. 
Today's feels like Saturday, but tomorrow's Monday, dude. Yep. Oh, shit. Um, I was going to tell you something about the... T take a look. We're going to send another email tomorrow, but take a look at your the list. Mm -hmm. oh, who has it open? Mm -hmm. Go by item, like by list. And it's like some that you didn't see opening. Try to reach direct and be like, hey, uh -huh. there's, you know. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I need to see which, how many. I usually have about 60% opening, right? That's good. Sure. That's really good. I am going to, uh, there's a lot of follow-ups I had to do for people start, like they want to subscribe already, wire ink's coming mm -hmm. in this week. And we need to find another partner by Friday. I see. Partner, that'll be ideal. Let me, uh, let me talk to. I'm going to talk to, I've been talking to a few folks that. Okay. There is one guy that he was a KP with us in Australia. Um, he, he's net worth is ridiculous, man. And he's the one who put a million dollars in one and put $2 million on Australia. Mm -hmm. Wow. So, but I, I we could give him a, like a couple of GP points for him as a yeah, breath yeah. for him to come in and then close the deal. Is that Perry guy? Yeah. No. no, another guy. He's from California. It's oh, a guy not from the group. His name is uh, Bruce. <clears throat> now we're going to stand up when the fire is going to get fired. I know. We're getting closer and more intense now, I bet. So what is your next five-year goal for multifamily? Because that you're heavily involved in a multifamily. And what is your five-year goal? My five-year goal is to have a platform to educate people as much as I can about the power of this investment. Mm -hmm. Obviously, that's going to come with uh, growing my portfolio and realize that um, at some point, you, you have to go beyond that goal um, and start thinking about how can I help people to know about this power of investment? Because it's not about me necessarily of making more money or having more properties or having more doors or whatever it is. It's not about that. It's about how many people lives you can change with this type of investment. And the more you spread the word, the better, you know, you, you open up the, uh, the possibilities for a lot of people that, they don't even know about this avenue. Absolutely. And it's like I was listening to the this other person talking about, you know, it's like imagine if you created this, you we are creating this platform for people to invest and such, but imagine that let's say your sister didn't know about it. And then 10 years from now, you change, you make double digits, double people's money and stuff. And you're like, how come this was an offer for me? And also definitely is an opportunity. Absolutely. It's like we said earlier, like, you know, for the passive investor to, uh, just the two things I said, well, first of all, vet the sponsors, what the track record, mm -hmm. what is the, you know, the, the uh, integrity of the GP team. But then nevertheless, the deal needs to make sense. You need to be, make sure that you under, uh, understand a little bit what is the projections, what is the, all the numbers in the business plan, make sure it's conservative enough, but those two together, man, it's safe. You're backed up on a property that you're be part of it. Yes, absolutely. You're not only an owner of the property, but uh, you're, um, as a passive investor, you are putting your trust in people that are running this business. And it's all about how you operate a deal. It's not, you know, I mean, you can have good people turning a bad deal in a second in a, into a good deal. And it's vice versa, too. You can have yeah. a great deal with bad management that can go south really fast. Exactly. It's, like it's, when all, you, it's a people business. Yeah. It's like in a business when you're hiring a CEO, right? The CEO with the track record is going to come in. 
adopt the culture of the company and take the company to the next level and run it. You know, and and that's why the the position that we are as a co GP is as a a CEO of that company, and you guys are part of the company too. You know, and we're here to take that company. Absolutely, and uh, for me personally, I, this is probably the biggest responsibility we have towards our investors and towards the tenants, uh, because you take on the trust of someone who gives their money to you, probably their life saving sometimes, and they want at least to trust you, you're going to do a good job. Um, so it's all about how you vet this sponsorship team, look at their track record, look at their way they're managing the property, they're operating this whole uh, system that they create, you know, for the for the property. And ultimately, you know, there, as you know, there are people that are not investing in, in a property because they know the, the deal, they know the person who are investing with, right? So that's a that's a big responsibility for all of us, you know, to to deliver to someone who put your trust, you know, the trust in you. Yeah, absolutely, and that's why you know what we always say is like you re take care of the tenants, that takes care of the property, and the property takes care of us investors. Yeah, you know, yep. it closes the cycle there. Absolutely. Good man, I uh, want to have this conversation with you five years from now. I was like, we're gonna probably gonna be. In another place and different and looking back, it's like, whoa, look where we became, look where we go. And that's why I love to see about some of my closest friends, which you're now in a circle band, <laughs> you know, and I be able to see that everybody's going to the same direction. Cause it's sad to see some of the friends that go different directions. You know, there's yeah. friends that we look behind as like, man, he didn't push hard or anything, but I, I like to see that now my closest friends are going to the same direction of not just, I'm not talking about financial nothing, but just opening their minds and doing better selves. Yeah, absolutely. And it's, it, you know, for all of us that are in the same kind of mindset uh, frame, it's important to evolve as a group and, you know, surround yourself with people that are thinking the same way. Um, because that's one of that's what's going to bring you to a different level you know the people you surround yourself with and you're one of them give me a piece of advice business advice or personal Whatever. advice both <laughs> i'm going to keep this your is beer by the way i'm just kidding <laughs> <laughs> um keep your focus on your health while you're young because there's going to be a time where you're going to prioritize that more and make sure you you do the little steps every day you know exercise eat well you know don't abuse stuff whatever everything in moderation because at some point it's going to count what about business advice business advice i don't know if i'm that position to give you a business advice but um I would say think bigger than you think you're going to think. You listen to this, Dahlia? <laughs> that was the reason I made fun of it because I try to, to think bigger than myself, but that's, that's interesting you say that because... Look... Just an example, look at yourself two years back. That's crazy. Right? Yeah, there's 180 degree for exactly. sure. Exactly. Exponentially 10x your ideas and your goals. Even if you don't get there, you're going to reach the moon anyway. Let's go. Thank you, brother. Thank you for awesome. coming to this fire table. The shit hits up. <laughs> Look at this. Look at this. We're still burning. Now I have an advice for you. Sure. Um, Grow some hair. Yeah. <laughs> 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 On the chest, maybe. <laughs> um, 
I think I told you this before, man. You, you, such a great personality on a one-on-one. People love to talk to you. People that talk to you, generally kind and open, sweet guy and awesome. And now I'm very happy to see that you are broadcasting this more open format to platforms, right? Yeah. Which people misinterpret sometimes social media network in a bad way. Oh, I don't want people to know what I'm doing or whatever. But people wants to know what you're doing because you're such a great guy, you know? And when I see you're doing stuff in there, especially business stuff, right? You, you inspiring other people, you're going to have haters. Everybody will. There's like, oh, look at him showing off. But the majority of the people that are impacted, it's going to be a lot greater. And it's a funny thing that sometimes when I open business and, you know, right now we have a kind of a presence on social media, people see it. Even though they don't hit the like button, they don't share, they don't comment, but they know, they see it. Mm-hmm. I know they're for a fact because when I have conversation with people that I haven't seen in a long time and they comment about it, a podcast that we did, an interview with so-and-so, and a one word that I said in the middle, was like, <laughs> man, you watched, how did you know? Yeah. And I know from that moment that they're, they're watching and automatically you're going to be able to uh, move inspire and touch more people yes and that's probably a great advice because i have to get out of my comfort zone you are more. getting a lot better i've seen some yes. of the emails and i, I see know. you got a I'm crm not, system now i know i'm working on it look i i do whatever i can but it's it's a limiting belief right yeah that you think oh i, I i'm not comfortable with doing this right now i don't know how i could show myself on the camera and stuff like that but it's I'm vulnerable, right? We all are. It's a, yeah. it's an emotional thing. It, once you get past that, you, I hope I can get there. You can, definitely can. And that's the thing I've been working also with Dale because now from the other side, this is what I used to do, help people to, you know, and now the biggest difficult for me is to be in front of the camera. I was behind the camera, right. helping other people to get better at the yes. camera. And now I'm um, the one speaking more and that's been challenging for me man i sometimes when i record those podcasts the real grind especially the first episodes we practice a lot before we even record the first episode we did in a different like we did one in a restaurant we did one here we recorded it and i come and watch and listen the whole thing and it's like how can i be a better speaker man <laughs> you saw when we were recording a webinar. Yeah. You know, I, I still messed up, right? Yeah. But I'm a lot better than what I used to. But the ultimately is like, how can you be yourself? Yes. How you and people, do? that's what people want. Yeah. They want exactly. your authenticity. They want your to see you're vulnerable. Yeah. You're a human being with, you know, your faults and your traits and whatever. You're right. normal. Right. So imagine this, like if you're talking, we're friends, but imagine something that is even closer to you. Let's say your brother, say you had a brother. I don't know if you had a brother, but you say you're talking to your brother. You just talk, you, you yeah. don't have to put anything, right? But now let's say that a president of the United States sits here. You'd be right. like all stiff and exactly. I'll like worry about it. But if you were to be the same way as you were talking to your brother to him, he might like you so much better yes. than what you try to level up to somebody or something, right? So that's right. our limiting belief that when we're talking on camera, we automatically think, oh, who's going to watch this and who's going to criticize me for? Yeah. And that little thing right there is a screwed us up, man. Me, myself included. It's like, what will people think about what I'm saying? What do people think about this? Yeah, they're probably the the people that appreciate that are the rate is much bigger than the ones that are criticizing you. And they're criticizing, they're taking the time to to watch it, and they're right, still gonna exactly. watch it. They're they're your biggest fans. Yeah, exactly. You accomplish <laughs> your goal right there. <laughs> you know exactly. But man, I, I love to see that growth on you. And I see because I remember we had this conversation before. And now mm-hmm. that you're doing all this, that I, I get super happy, man. And whatever I can add value, anything you. Yeah, I appreciate that. I I have something, somebody to look up to now. No, man. Right there in front of me. Whatever, man. Thank you, buddy. Thank you so much, Tudor. And I hope that uh, podcast 
uh, recording here was uh, inspirational. You've been to our Rio Grind. Go check in the link below, guys, to see that episode with this guy where he shares a little bit about his story, how he got started on this industry and all his uh, hiccups that he had coming to the United States. That was an amazing story, man. Yeah, it's it's an amazing story. And I hope, you know, people, that's my goal, actually, to inspire someone that, like me, that thinks that they can do things because they're either too weak or they don't have resources or they don't know the language or they don't know finances or whatever it is. Anything is possible. And if I did it, anybody can do it. And put your mind to it. Yep. Let's go, Twitter. Thanks, Let's go. brother. Oh, man. We can, I mean, you, you can spend the whole day. <laughs>